The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, she wowed Simon Cowell. And not just because of her singing. This America's Got Talent alum shares her inspirational story. And later, love at first sight. I just fell madly in love with this woman. One woman falls head of her heels for her co-worker. I can marry this girl. I love her. Why not? What struck fear into her heart? This is trouble. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Today we're bringing you a story on Ukraine that you may not be able to see anywhere else. It's a holy mission. That's how the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church is describing the brutal war in Ukraine. He also supports Putin's vision of uniting the whole Russian-speaking world under Moscow's control. Well, at least seven people died when missiles hit the western city of Lviv this morning. Ukrainian troops in Mariupol are now surrounded by enemy forces. Still, the brave defenders have vowed to keep fighting absolutely to the end. Dale Hurd has the latest. Plumes of thick black smoke rose over the city of Lviv today from multiple explosions caused by four Russian missile strikes. Reportedly among the dead was a four-year-old child. Meanwhile, in the port city of Mariupol, surrounded by Russian forces, a small number of Ukrainian fighters are hanging on, as Ukraine's president says the outcome could change the course of the entire war. The Russian army says about 2,500 Ukrainian fighters are holed up inside this sprawling steel plant, the final pocket of the city's resistance. We will fight absolutely till the end, till the win in this war. Bodies lay out in the open as residents like this woman and her nieces try to flee. Their mother went to get diapers and disappeared, she says. We don't know where she is. Thousands remain trapped without food and water. Millions of refugees are fleeing the country. As they cross the border into Poland, they're met with hot food, blankets, and supplies from CBN's Operation Blessing. In the face of all this suffering, it might surprise many in the West to learn that Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has the enthusiastic support of the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill. A close ally of Putin, Kirill continues to preach that Russian believers should support the war in Ukraine as a holy mission. This dates back around 10 years ago at the beginning of Putin's third term. Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, um, began working in tandem with Putin, it, kind of having the Russian Orthodox Church operate as a form of soft power for Putin in the region. Earlier this month, Kirill delivered a sermon to Russian military leaders in a cathedral dedicated to Russia's armed forces. According to a report from Religion Dispatches, the patriarch referred to a version of history that sees no distinction between Russia and Ukraine, essentially not recognizing Ukraine's existence as an independent nation, and did not even recognize Ukrainians as a separate people by referring to all involved in the conflict as holy Russians. Kirill has preached that it is God's truth that the people of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus should be reunited as one spiritual people. This is Putin's doctrine of Ruski Mir, or Russian world, which holds that ancient Russia must be reunited and Moscow has the right to dominate its neighbors. Kirill started preaching a ideology, this idea of a Russian world, or particularly a holy Rus, this sort of transnational Russian sphere of civilization that included Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and some other parts of Eastern Europe, um, and where the idea would be that Moscow was the political center and while Vladimir Putin was a Soviet KGB agent, records from the Cold War revealed Patriarch Kirill was a KGB spy during Soviet times. Kirill has described Putin's leadership of Russia as a religious miracle. While Putin critic Mikhail Khodorkovsky says Putin sees for himself a prospect of being kind of a messiah, a person who unites the whole Russian-speaking world. And for Patriarch Kirill, Vladimir Putin is God's instrument to fight against the decadent West. Dale Hurd, CBN News.
Well, you're not an instrument of God when you're slaughtering innocents. Uh, the killing of innocents is never justified by any Christian tradition. Uh, there is no excuse for it. Thou shalt not kill is a commandment. And that is certainly being done now. And they're killing the civilian population. Uh, you can't have this kind of doctrine in the face of the clear pictures of bodies in the streets with their hands tied behind them where they were executed in the middle of the street. These are civilians. They're noncombatants. You cannot possibly justify this. Well, this doctrine of the Russian world, we have to understand the ideology that's driving this war and how Russia, that is being repeated over and over again, and to hear to find the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church doing it in the Cathedral of the Armed Forces, it really boggles the mind that he is saying that this is a holy war, uh, that they're struggling against fascists in the Ukraine, uh, and that it's fully justified, and this is something that the armed forces of Russia should fully engage in. Well, the churches of Europe are now calling on that same patriarch to observe a ceasefire for Holy Week. And here we're getting into different calendars. We follow the Gregorian calendar, so our Easter was this past, our Holy Week was this past week. Theirs is just beginning because they follow the Julian calendar. So Russia is on the Julian calendar, so is Ukraine. And what they're asking for is, can there be a ceasefire so that the so the Christians on both sides of the border can celebrate Easter. So Holy Week is just getting underway in Ukraine. And Wendy Griffith was with worshipers and leave as they gathered to celebrate Palm Sunday. Lviv is home to some of the most beautiful churches in the world, and nearly a hundred adorn the city. Most were shut down during the Soviet era, but the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 triggered a resurgence of the Christian faith and its churches, including this magnificent Greek Catholic Church of St. Andrew. Here in Ukraine, it's Palm Sunday. Easter is still a week away, but the churches are packed with people praying. But just as Jesus defeated death on a cross, Ukraine will also see a victory. We have this uh, Christian tradition that Christ is risen and Ukraine will be risen too. And uh, we strongly, strongly believe that uh, the enemy will fall down and we will have this victory. Here in Lviv, considered a safe haven for residents and refugees alike, airstrikes were reported over the weekend. Dear guests, a name and has been issued in Lviv. Please stay calm and go down for the reception in the shelter. And many churches are boarded up with priceless statues heavily wrapped in case the worst happens. So they're saying now that uh, nobody is off limits. There is no safe havens now, not even Lviv. Yes. Are you scared? Yes. Are you worried? Uh, actually, actually not scary because I understand my, lobby, my life belongs to Christ. Uh, I need to do what God tells me to do. So you're not leaving? Uh, what? You're, you're not uh, leaving. Yes, I am not supposed to leave. My wife uh, stay with me too. I have two children and uh, we are trusting God. Believers at Spring of Life Church are praying around the clock for their country. And Arson says during a recent time of prayer, God gave him some good news for Ukraine. I just start praying in my, in my spirit and I receive this word that Russia will be defeated. Russia will be defeated. When you are uh, hearing all dangerous, all like, don't be, don't be in panic, just lift it up your hand and pray it will be like a shield. When you are lifted up your hands, it will be like a shield. And you can see our pastors, when you're praying, he, a lot of say, lifted up your hand, lifted up your hand. So that's what we are doing when we are hearing all the bad news, all the rockets. Yes, we, we got a lot of rockets in our city Lviv too, but praise God, everybody, it's like we're doing a case. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Lviv, Ukraine. Well, let's pray for the peace of Ukraine. Let's pray, pray that they can find a way to a ceasefire. Uh, during Holy Week uh, it would be a really good time for Christians on both sides of that border to say, let's lay down our arms. Let's not kill each other. Uh, let's go celebrate Easter. Let's celebrate. He is risen. He is risen indeed. 
Please pray for that. Also, please help the refugees who are streaming across the border as Russia turns into a more brutal campaign, particularly in the eastern part, the Donbass region of Ukraine. Um, millions are fleeing and we want to help them. They're leaving everything. They are arriving in Poland and the other countries, Romania, literally with nothing and no way to make an income. So we want to help them. We want to provide food. We want to provide shelter. We want to provide the things that they need. So you can be a part of it. How? Contribute to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. You can also text OB Crisis to 71777. You can call us 1 800 700 7000 or go to CBN.com. Either way, do it now. Be part of helping those in need. Well, in other news, President Biden and Democrats in Congress are pushing for another $10 billion in COVID spending. Charlene Aaron has that story from our CBN newsroom. Charlene? That's right, Gordon. The Biden administration says it needs new funding to continue the fight against COVID. Some lawmakers point out that much of the money already allocated has been misspent. As Matt Galka tells us, they're calling for accountability. Members of Congress will be returning from their break soon. And when they do, one of the issues they'll be working on is new money to spend on COVID and pandemic response. But before they get to that point, some lawmakers want to know what happened to the rest of the money. A ballpark upgrade, a new hotel, a ski area, and a prison facelift. What do they have in common? Local governments using federal COVID dollars to pay for the projects, most coming from the billions in taxpayer money given out as part of the American Rescue Plan. While the legislation was intended to help Americans recover from the COVID economic impact, it also allowed broad definitions for how the money could be used. The American Rescue Plan provided $350 billion to state and local governments with very few strings attached. Citizens Against Government Waste President Tom Schatz says he's not surprised at this result. Federal government is very good at giving out money and not caring how it gets spent and then not worrying about whether it comes back if it's being wasted. Uh, there are no guarantees when the money comes from Washington. When Congress returns from recess, lawmakers will likely have to decide on a new COVID funding bill requested by the Biden administration. Some, however, are already asking how the initial recovery money got spent and looking to offset new spending by repurposing old funds. There was uncertainty back then. Live and learn. And we need to make sure that we're not hiding unspent COVID funds when we're talking about maybe spending more on COVID should it flare up again. Senator Mitt Romney led the negotiations on repurposing COVID money before the break. His office says they reached a $10 billion agreement for a new bill before it hit other hangups. The Heritage Foundation's Doug Badger says there will still be challenges to get the bill passed in Congress when lawmakers return. At this point, when the administration says we need money for COVID, it should be met with bipartisan skepticism. Congress should be asking the tough questions. Before going on break, it did look like a deal was struck for new COVID spending, but it got derailed when it was tied to Title 42, an immigration measure affecting the southern border. That could still play a factor when the recess ends. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Staying in our nation's capital, an annual Easter tradition returned after being canceled the past two years due to COVID. Praise, worship, and prayer filled the air at the Lincoln Memorial for the 42nd Memorial Sunrise Service hosted by Capitol Church. Dr. Mark Batterson of Commu National Community Church delivered the message. The Roman Empire is long gone, so let me flip that ancient coin. 2,000 years later, two billion people from every nation, tribe, people, language proclaim the name of Jesus and celebrate this thing called Easter. Thousands attended the early morning service. In Israel, hundreds of worshipers gathered at Jerusalem's garden tomb, the site where many believe Jesus Christ was buried and rose from the dead. Simon Holland from the garden tomb led those gathered in the ancient Easter greeting for Christians on Resurrection Day. We declare to Jerusalem, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. And we declare to the nations, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. 
CBN live stream both the Israel and Washington, D.C. services, and you can see them on CBNNews.com. Gordon? Well, you can watch it. All you have to do is go to CBNNews.com. You can relieve these moments, both from our nation's capital and then from Jerusalem, from the Garden Tomb. Wonderful services. Uh, let's all celebrate Easter, and I hope uh, we can go, move forward in this pandemic and continue to be able to celebrate uh, on Sunday in our churches. Terry? Well, up next, there are going to be plenty of new faces in Congress next year. And if the Republicans get their way, the red wave will be a pink one. And still ahead, she was one of two survivors of a Nigerian plane crash. And later, a finalist on America's Got Talent. Hear her inspiring story of thriving through the scars. That's later on today's show. Soaring inflation, rising crime, war in Ukraine, these issues all spell trouble for Democrats in 2022. Along with the fact that the party in power always faces greater challenges in midterm elections, something even more troubling is in store for Democrats this year. A rise of women and minority Republican candidates. Tara Mergener explains. Build as the party's rising stars. We have so many Republican women, it's hard to fit us in one press conference. <laughs> Aiming to make history. There are nine candidates in my race. I'm the only female candidate. And help their team take back Congress. This is going to be a pink wave. Party leaders are touting another year of the Republican woman. I am running against uh, a man who, combined with Joe Biden, has been in office for 89 years. Only bigger. I'm running to save the American dream. Thanks for the 2022 momentum going largely to Representative Elise Stefanik, the third ranking House Republican who created EPAC to get more women elected, raising more than three million campaign dollars. After the 2018 midterms, we were down to 13 Republican women. And in just one cycle, we were over 30. I actually predict that we'll be over 50 Republican women in the next Congress. Think about that. It's a goal likely to be helped by the fierce headwinds facing the current party in power. Voters are frustrated with what they're seeing on the border. Inflation. Uh, I have I met with voters saying I have to decide whether to put gas in my car or buy eggs for my children. More than 280 GOP women have filed to run for Congress, beating 2020's historic high. They call the race. <laughs> when 33 got elected, flipping 11 of the 15 seats that went from blue to red. Stefanik's group is supporting 18 candidates so far this round in what it calls the most diverse and impressive roster to date. They are going to focus on standing up for conservative values. Uh, they are strongly pro-life. They are pro-family. And that's where the Republican voters are today. That's where this country is. Several candidates are endorsed by former President Trump. When you look at what President Trump was able to do in both 16 and 20 in terms of changing minds and bringing people into the party that have never voted Republican before, uh, you know, swinging some of those independent votes, that's a lot of what we plan to do as well. While Democrats tout the diversity within their ranks, the GOP believes it's poised to put a record number of black Republicans in Congress. We are seeing Republicans continuing to build on what they see is, you know, small but, you know, growing influence within the black voter community. And some 80 black candidates are running this cycle. With a new generation of leadership, we can secure our border, strengthen our economy and put our financial house in order up from 27 in 2020. We're going to win this time. Yeah. The lineup is well-funded. I love seeing your beautiful, maskless faces. Yeah. With some big names and famous faces on the marquee. My name is Herschel Walker, and I'm running for the United States Senate. Right now, Black Republicans hold just two seats in the House, one in the Senate. Backers are hoping there's still wind in the sails following Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears' historic victory in Virginia. And put your left hand on the Bible. As the first woman of color to win statewide office. Congratulations. Recent polls show strong party alignment with the black community on issues like abortion, education and immigration. Surveys show the GOP is warning about rising crime 
and the economy, shoppers are pinching pennies as inflation continues to soar, is also resonating. The number of black voters favoring Democrats down 21 points since last fall. This is something that Republicans are very much trying to use to connect to all voting groups, but especially uh, black voters. Each Republican who flipped a Democrat-held House district in 2020 was a woman or person of color. Optimism is growing that 2022 will be the year these history makers will become majority makers. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, speaking as an old white man, I applaud this. I think this is absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful to see people coming to the government saying we want to represent all Americans. Our government should always reflect our population. And that is a, it's a great encouragement. One narrative to watch out for in this upcoming election is this so-called white supremacy. It just really bothered me that in this past fall, people were saying that the Republican victory in Virginia was somehow a victory for white supremacists. And I was scratching my head. I can figure this out because here you had an African-American woman win for lieutenant governor. The first time in the Commonwealth's history, an African-American woman was elected to statewide office. And then to add to it, a Cuban-American man was elected to be attorney general. So how does that add up to white supremacy? I don't get it. But it's wonderful to see, and I applaud it. It's great when people come to government and say, let's represent everyone. There. It looks like Winsome Sears has started something. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful woman. Well, up next, she's an internationally known speaker and a recipient of Simon Cowell's Golden Buzzer. Hear her incredible story of survival, hope, and unshakable faith throughout it all right after this. Here's high praise from one of the most prickly judges of talent in the entertainment world. Simon Cowell says, Kechi Okuchi isn't just a singer, she's an inspiration. He, along with millions at home, were wound by Kechi during the 12th season of America's Got Talent. Even more impressive than her singing ability, the story of how she made it to the stage in the first place. Author Kechi Okuchi was 16 years old when she survived a devastating plane crash in Nigeria, which left her with third-degree burns on over 65% of her body. She could have given up, but instead, she persevered. She shared her painful story for the first time in 2017 as a vocalist on America's Got Talent. Her talent and courage inspired millions. In her book, More Than My Scars, Kachi encourages others with her story of survival and how she learned to redefine her identity the way God sees her. Well, Ketchy joins us now via Skype. Ketchy, welcome to the 700 Club. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Will you share with us, if you will, go back for a moment and tell us what do you remember from the crash? I mean, that's kind of everyone's nightmare. Very true. It was um, in 2005. I was 16 years old, senior in high school, and I was heading home for the Christmas holidays with um, 60 other students from my high school, along with other passengers. And I remember there were 109 of us on the plane, including the flight crew. I remember it just being a very regular flight until it just suddenly wasn't. You know, about 15 minutes left in the flight when the pilot had started a descent. That's when the turbulence started that just got out of hand and got everyone panicking, screaming and praying. And just, it was just chaos inside the cabin. Like it was crazy. And I remember the last thing I did was, the last thing I remember is holding my friend's hand. She was in the aisle seat next to mine. And um, it was just like this really loud scraping metal sounds that jars the brain that like, that's the last thing I remember feeling before the darkness took over. And I guess at that point, that's when the plane crashed, but I blacked out before any crash essentially. And then I, my next memory after that is opening my eyes, five weeks had passed and I was waking up from a coma in South Africa in the hospital in Johannesburg. Unbelievable, unbelievable that you survived that. There were only two of you that made it out alive. 
after that crash. You were in a coma for weeks after you woke up and many procedures had been done to you. Um, there came the day where you were going to look in the mirror for the first time. And your reaction to, to me was astonishing. I mean, you weren't really you weren't really, you didn't seem to be really shocked. You seemed to be able to see the positive in it. Talk about that. It was very interesting. And definitely um, the most significant, I would say, moment of my time in South Africa because of what I I learned, what I realized um, in that moment. You know, it became the foundation of everything that I have done since then and how I've lived my life. You know, by the mantra that my scars do not define me. It was born in that moment when I saw myself for the first time after the accident. And I remember before the moment where I saw myself, I was very nervous, you know, just like my parents, just like anyone that knew me, because I was concerned about what my new appearance would do to my personality, how it would affect like how I move about life from now on. I knew from the bandages I could see on the rest of my body that my face obviously was also affected. But to what degree, I did not know. But I wanted to know so I could start getting better at whatever it is like I feel, you know, whatever trauma I may feel from looking different. And I remember when I saw the reflection, finally, my mom raised the mirror to my face and um, everything just looked so like pink and just there was no skin on my face. And I just did not look anything like the catchy that I remember. You know, the last time I saw myself, I did not look like that. Very different reflection. But somehow in the midst of that, I still, I remember just seeing a stranger, but at the same time, someone very familiar. It was, it was very eerie and hard to describe because even though I didn't look like catchy, I felt like catchy. And for me, that was what defined everything because I came to the realization that if I still feel like me, even if I don't look like me, then whatever it is that makes me who I am has to come from something other than my physical appearance. And that thought was just so freeing. And it's just, I've lived like that ever since, essentially. Very mature in the midst of all of that. Uh, talk a little bit about how your faith helped you through the healing process, because we're talking about a process that took a long, long time and a lot of pain and multiple, multiple operations. Where did your faith come into all of that? My faith is something that um, I had from just being born into and living in a Christian household. You know, at first as a kid, up until the moment the accident happened, it was an obligatory part of my life. It was just something I took for granted, something that I had because my parents believed it. It wasn't anything personal until after the accident when I got to a place that I had to kind of uh, redefine what it means to be a Christian for myself. For the first time, I had to decide what God meant to me and have like the interest in developing something direct and personal with him as opposed to, a you know, kind of a, an indirect faith that I had from my mom, you know, and she was really my she was my, I guess, role model, really, when it came to faith. You know, I, I wanted what she had. And I wanted to see God the way that she saw him. You know, I wanted to understand him from her perspective because what she saw, how she represented faith was full of love and so giving and so heartfelt. And I just felt like having access to something like that would give me a peace that um, I would need to get through what I was going through. And so that was what began my journey. That, that was seeing her faith kind of um, mirrored this interest in me that just that, that was what gave birth to my interest in just knowing about God and learning about him for myself. And honestly, I cannot, I mean, just the fact that I see myself the way I do comes from the fact that I see myself how God sees me, yeah. because I know that he sees all of us as valuable and he never, he doesn't care how we look. He cares about what's inside our hearts that he put inside us. And seeing that, seeing through those eyes is what has helped me so I mean, that right there should tell you everything, really. <laughs> yeah, your mom is quite a remarkable woman. As I read the book, I, I thought without the inspiration that she was and the way she just put herself right in the midst of your life and your healing, you might not have made it. I most certainly would not have made it because in the beginning, she was my reason for even living. I was waking up every day hoping to see her face. Eventually, it became something that I wanted for myself, but without that foundation of my mom being that reason, I would not be here today.
So, Ketchy, tell me a little bit about being on America's Got Talent, because you had sung before, but never publicly, really. And then after the accident, your voice actually changed. What was your purpose in going on America's Got Talent, and what was that like for you? Well, it's interesting because I actually didn't even sign up for the show for, by myself. But one of my best friends actually signed me up without telling me. And she ex essentially changed my entire life with that one move. You know, she'd been telling me for years to do it, as had my dad. But I just never felt like my voice was good enough. Even though, yes, it did change after the accident, unexplainably, I still didn't feel like I was good enough to put myself on a platform like that where I would compete with other singers. Like, I just would never have done something like that. If my friend didn't put me out there and then eventually get me to a place where I had to decide that this is something I wanted to do, I would never have had the opportunity I did to be on EGT and to get even like to the end of the show. So it was something that I was kind of put into. And then I, I got to a place where I was like, are you going to do this or not? I mean, now that you're here, you got to you have to give your all. That's what you have to do. So um, that was one of the most incredible experiences of my life, not just the fact that Simon, of all people, really seemed to like me and take to me and really encourage me. But also the fact that the show gave me this platform to expose my, like, it gave me this exposure to kind of allow myself to share my story and my voice with the world in an inspiring way. And it's something I've always wanted to do, but I never had that kind of access to people until I was on the show. So for me, I think that was the biggest gift from being on EGT. Well, your story is quite remarkable, um, and I just want all of our viewers to know you can discover more of Ketchy's story by getting her brand new memoir. It's called More Than My Scars, and it is available nationwide. Ketchy, thank you so much for being with us. God bless you. God bless you, too. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Gordon? Well, up next, a business deal goes bad, and a young entrepreneur has to move back home with his parents. See how his mother helped him rebuild his financial future. Then later, looking for love in all the wrong places. One woman starts an office romance with a female coworker. See why it was trouble at first sight. That's coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News break. Today is the deadline for filing federal taxes. The IRS is expecting to receive tens of millions of last minute filings electronically. One expert tells the Associated Press, if you haven't filed yet, you're better off filing an extension, stating that it's better than having to amend your taxes later. The agency is reminding taxpayers that if they need help requesting an extension or other assistance, they can go to irs.gov. Well, this month, five members of the global CBN team completed the London Landmarks Half Marathon. CBN Europe was privileged to participate for the first time as an official charity partner. The CBN team ran 13.1 miles on roads with views of some of London's most iconic landmarks. Gizmo ran in the Mascot Dash. CBN took part to raise funds for the people of Ukraine and added many donations to those which partners have already given. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Gordon and Terry will be right back right after this. Will Burke was a high-stepping entrepreneur in his mid-20s. Then a major business deal went bad. Will lost everything and he was forced to move back in with his parents. Here's his story. 28-year-old Will Burke is a go-getter. In 2017, he started his own business selling electronics. I've always kind of had this like entrepreneurial itch. I actually got network connections with people who would buy electronics stateside and ship them internationally. As a pastor's kid, Will knew he should be tithing. But the more he earned, the harder it became to tithe. My priorities started slipping a little bit. I started not going to church as much, got a fancy apartment that I probably shouldn't have gotten. I stopped, you know, tithing. I wasn't reading my Bible. Then in late 2018, Will took out a loan to invest in a business deal with his main supplier. The deal went bad, and Will was left thousands of dollars in debt. It was this really dark time in my life. I 
had to break the lease on my apartment. I had to move back in with my parents. That's not what you want to do when you're 27. I was pretty discouraged. Will started doing freelance web design and decided to begin tithing from his small income. I really put my nose to the grindstone. I was consistent with my tithing. I started making money again, and I'm like, this is great. Plus, his former business associate returned his investment. I took it as like a confirmation as like, okay, like, I've, I've taken care of you, I've cleaned up after your mess. Will spent the rest of 2019 working to pay off debt and saving to attend grad school. He took his first course online that fall and made plans to relocate to become a full-time student. I was high-stepping into 2020, man. I'm like, this is it. This is my year. Then the night before the move, Will got sick. I contracted COVID. And for the next like 10 days, two weeks, I was in constant pain, coughing. While he was recovering, Will's bank account was hacked. In sleep at night, I'm in constant pain. I can't leave. I'm not talking to God. I was, I was done. I was mad. Will also stopped tithing. But there was one bright spot. During that time, Will's mom started turning on the 700 Club each morning. It was such a little encouragement, and I came to really enjoy it. It was a really healing experience for me. Will decided to start giving again and became a CBN partner. Seeing all of the things that CBN does through Operation Blessing, Orphan's Promise, things that are close to my heart, like sustainable solutions for impoverished communities. What you're giving actually goes to these incredible, incredible causes. I was just like, I've, I've got to be a part of this. Over the next few months, Will's bank recouped 75% of his money. Will continued rebuilding his business while working on his degree online. Since then, he's recovered both physically and financially. My business has exploded. I actually hired my first employee recently. I'm in a better position than I was before I knew what I was doing. And so it's impossible for me to not be grateful. Now Will looks forward to the future. He also encourages others to trust God with their tithes. You're giving that in anticipation that the Lord is gonna multiply that in ways that you don't understand. God will do it for you too. You just have to trust in him. God wants to bless his children. When you have that principle in mind that he loves you, he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. When you understand he loves giving, he wants to pour out blessings over you. What is he waiting for? Well, what he's waiting for is your obedience to say, I'm going to do it God's way. When you understand that everything you have comes from God, and he's looking for you to be a good steward of it, and when you show that to him, then he opens the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing you can't contain. Will learned that. He was in desperate circumstances he decided, let's give God a try. Let's do it God's way. And in that, he walked into a tremendous life secret. Give, and it will be given unto you. We call it the law of reciprocity. It's not some get-rich-quick scheme by any means. It's not some proof of your holiness or anything like that. But it is a principle that Jesus Christ laid out. You can find it in the Gospel of Luke. Give, and it will be given unto you. We call it the law of reciprocity. You put it into motion. You don't wait for the blessing. You say, I'm going to put this into motion and it will be given unto me. If you want to start doing that, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. I want to be a part of everything you're doing around the world. I want to be a part of helping Ukrainian refugees. I want to be a part of providing drinking water to villages around the world. I want to be a part of providing special surgeries. I want to be a part of providing for orphans. I want to be a part of preaching the gospel around the world. If that's you, call us. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? It's $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels, and we have other club levels for you. 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. Now, when you call, I've got something for you. It's my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, Understanding the Miraculous Power of God. 
He distills down 60 years of ministry, how my mother and father gathered. They would ask God together, show us the way, show us what to do, guide CBN, guide Operation Blessing, guide Regent University. God would answer those prayers, show them things in Scripture. They would take that leading, that guidance, put it into practice, and wonderful things happen. All of these secrets can be yours if you get this wonderful book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in, your, in You. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, a quick glance turns to romance, and suddenly this woman has a big choice to make. Her decision and how it led her to find true love right after this. In all the decades of biblical archaeology, there hasn't been a single discovery that disproves the Bible. In fact, archaeology supports the accuracy of the Bible, and you can learn all about it in CBN Films' new documentary, Written in Stone, Kings and Prophets. For your gift of any dollar amount, we're raising funds for our next documentary called The Oracles of God, so we want your contributions to help fund that. So a gift of any dollar amount will send you this all-new DVD. You'll also get exclusive instant streaming access in 4K on the CBN Family app. To get it, all you have to do is go to cbn.com slash written in stone, or you can call us 1-800-700-7000, or you can text KINGS uh, to 80888. Either way, do it now and get this wonderful DVD. Tara? It's been said love is a battlefield. Chris Olson found herself in the middle of two warring sides. Soon she had to make a choice between the woman she loved and the God she served. Growing up, Chris Olson felt deeply rejected by her father. My dad never expressed a lot of emotion. If I ever tried to reach out to him, he would push me away physically. I felt rejected as a, a female. I felt rejected as just a human being. And so to me, I took things in as this is how men are. Her mother confirmed Chris's feelings. Don't trust men, they're no good. Get your own education, make your own money. I made a vow to um, never be married and I made a vow to never open up my heart to my dad. In high school, Chris began looking for acceptance through female relationships. You know, my same-sex attraction began with what I would call like emotional draw. I would pick somebody who was pretty, popular and had what I'd like to be, and I would start manipulating my way into their world. But the real need inside of me was to be around this person, to feel like I had value, to feel like I was pretty, to feel like I was needed. Chris continued to struggle with same-sex attraction throughout college, but she never acted on those feelings. Instead, she looked to her faith. You know, honestly, I felt like, um, like I, I didn't fully give my life completely utterly to the Lord till I was 33, but I feel like His hand was always on me. He was always with me. However, her spiritual resolve was tested when she entered the business world. It happened during her first company meeting. I looked across the room and I connected with my eyes with another woman. I was immediately attracted. And I could see she was too. And I heard the Lord clearly say to me in my heart, um, this is trouble. Chris soon realized that in order to do her job, she needed to collaborate with the woman. The two began working together. And then we started just kind of hanging out after doing that a little bit and talking, and that progressed to kind of the weekends. And just out of all of that, I just fell madly in love with this woman. I, I ended up being introduced to the world of lesbian behavior, sexuality. I was really starting to think, you know, I can marry this girl. I love her. Why not? You know, I could still have my relationship with God. Who would know? I was beginning to become deceived by my sin. I knew in my heart that what I was doing and engaging in and thinking was wrong, but I was starting to justify it. I would often speak scripture to her when we were having a conversation. We're sitting in my car one night, we're talking, we're having this conversation. I mentioned some scriptural, you know, thing to apply to it. And she just blew up and she said, shut up. I am so tired of hearing about Jesus. I want, I want nothing to do with him. I don't want to become a Christian. 
And if you want to keep seeing me and you don't want me to disappear and get out of this car and never see me again, you will never say his name again. And in that moment, I felt the spiritual battle going on for me. I was having a hard time deciding. I mean, it was just a battle. I just heard God say, choose, choose. Eventually, Chris made her choice. I didn't want to lose my relationship with God. I didn't want to have a place where I could not hear his voice or pray and feel like he's answering my prayers. I chose Jesus because he is the better love. He is the more perfect love. He is the one that loves me the best. When I, when I left that relationship, it was like that was it. I threw everything out, all the music, all the memorabilia, all the anything that reminded me of her. Uh, I really cut it off and I, like I said, began seeking the Lord, really wanting to be around Him, wanting to be around the Word of God, really seriously getting into prayer again and really reestablishing a solid walk with Jesus. I repented of all of that. I don't believe it and I don't behave in that fashion any longer. Chris has also been able to reconcile one other relationship. I'm able to hug my father. I'm able to give him a kiss, even if he's not really taking it in. It doesn't matter. I'm able to express it because I've forgiven him fully. In 2009, Chris founded Coming Out Again, an outreach that helps those struggling in unwanted homosexual, lesbian, or transgender behavior. And Chris continues to share her story to help others find true freedom and identity in Christ. I am so thankful for my deliverance from all these things, for my transformation, for God restoring my original gender intention, my original gender attractions, and uh, just to be who He always intended for me to be. And the journey isn't over. I'm still on the journey. I don't know what He has ahead, but with Jesus, it's always good. It is always good because His love is immeasurable. It's so hard for us to grasp how much he loves us. You know, it's a good thing in Chris's life that she knew God before she got into this relationship because she knew it was the greater love. It was the better love. It was the, it was the choice. But every one of us in our lives, no matter what our temptation is, no matter what's facing us, have to come to that crossroads where we make a choice. You know, it's the world versus God. And he's asking us sometimes to give up a relationship that matters. Sometimes it's a same-sex relationship. Sometimes it's an unhealthy heterosexual relationship. It can be many things. It can be a career that owns you and you can't be the person you're supposed to be. You know, sin is sin and God calls it that in his word and it's why he says if you love me you'll obey me he calls us to a different place to a deeper place to a place of denial in many instances but also a place of healing a place of coming home to the father heart of God you know no matter where we've been no matter what we've done that call of God, that call of the Holy Spirit is in your heart and in your mind. And you'll never fully be satisfied until you come home to what you were created for. We talk about the fact that a relationship with God is not about religion. It is a relationship. And it's heart to heart. It's mind to mind. It's spirit to spirit. And it's where you were intended to dwell for eternity. If you've been away from God, I want to invite you today to come back. Come back to his heart. He knows who you are. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He doesn't care. He loves you. So come back to him and humbly confess your sin with the heart willing to trade, to trade where you've been and what's held you captive for all that he has purposed for you. Just be honest. It's a conversation. Jesus, I need you. I want you. This is where I've been and what I've done. Please forgive me. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please open the door of heaven to me. I want to belong to you. Ask him that and ask it in Jesus' name. And listen, 
if you want to start a relationship with God, how do I do that? You're saying, well, we've got this packet, a new day. It's absolutely free. It's yours for the asking. Just call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Ask for it. We'll get it out to you right away. Gordon. Well, we leave you today with these words of victory from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let today be vic a victorious day in Him. You can always have the victory in Jesus. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.